Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Studying Abroad. I'm going to be your host for today. I'm Abiata Otu with the support of our wonderful and ever gorgeous Barbara. Um, today's topic or episode is going to talk about the researching graduate schools in the US. Um, this topic I feel is a very critical topic we need to talk about because um, mostly when we are researching schools in the US, we just go for the well-known popular schools. And you know, with those schools comes with a lot of competition. And at the end of the day, it's all about the funding, you understand? So to just select schools that fit our bill or gives us the highest chance of getting into those schools with funding, that's the most important thing. That's the purpose of this uh, episode. So I'm going to allow the team to introduce themselves that we start with today's episode. Okay, guys. Let us show you yourself and Alice. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Abiata, for standing in for me today. And I'm Barbara Boadje, and today um, I'm just here to just enjoy what uh, Edward has in store for us, and just like everybody to also learn a lot uh, to learn a lot in how to select schools. And as Abiata has rightly put it, it's not really just about just selecting schools. You may get the admission, but what's the essence of getting an admission without funding and you do not have uh, money for funding? So, yeah, I'm excited for this session. I hope to learn from it. Yeah, thank you, Abiata. Hey. Okay, thank you. Um, happy to be back on this channel. Uh, second time on this channel. I'm excited about this session. Uh, my name is Edward. I'm a, currently a graduate student at the University of Texas at Arlington. I'm in the fourth year of my PhD, and I've had so many experiences over the years with applying to graduate school in the United States. And I'm here to share again how to actually do some research before you select the graduate school of your choice. And also, you know, helping you get that scholarship that you always wanted. Thank you. Hello. Um, this is my first time on the channel, and my name is Ama Nidu Appel, final year student of the University of Ghana Legal and studying actuarial science. Um, as everyone, knows, this channel helps students who look to study in the U.S. for their graduate and PhD program. So um, I'm here to learn and also ask questions and relating to the processes and applications so that I can make the best out of um, my opportunities and hopefully get a good school with a good funding in, in for, for 2020. Yes, Can you introduce yourself to us? Then we take off. We take off. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, my name is Joshua Nkubosiako. Um, I'm also a prospective student to um, Missouri University of Science and Technology, but um, I was I've been admitted without any funding, and I've been worrying Barbara to help me get funding and. Uh, <laughs> I'm also chasing the government to also help me get funding. Yeah, so um, I'm yet to book my appointment and also book for an emergency appointment. I was also admitted to um, Florida International University. That was a, a direct PhD. But they said because graduation has been stored for this year and because of the COVID, so probably they will consider me for next year. So I should apply for next year, but I need to take opportunities um, the um, uh, the priority one, which is the Missouri International University of Science and Technology. So I'm considering that one for this year. I'm hoping for the best, but anything can happen, whatever be it. Then probably next year, I can also consider um, Florida International University for the direct PhD. So that's um, a little bit about me. Thank you. Okay, Joshua. Thank you very much. 
Funny enough, I also have admissions in Missouri SNT. I actually have a partial funding and we're still working on trying to get the full funding. So let's see what happens. Uh, okay. Uh, before I let Quam, uh, it would Quam take over. I just want to say the last episode was top notch and people keep on texting me like, guy, who, who did you bring on board? Who did Barbara bring on board? And they were very inspired. It was very insightful. People are pumped to, you know, apply to the US. So I know this today's session is going to be fire. So you know what? I leave this floor to you. You can take over. Okay, uh, what an introduction, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, definitely great, great, great introduction. I think that we are in a good place. We are, I'm personally here to share my own experience. I want to be careful in sharing this experience because this might not be the story for you, but I feel like you can get some things um, from, from this. You can uh, pick up some few nuggets here and there that can actually help you succeed in getting that scholarship. It takes a whole lot. Um, it takes so many parts of your scholarship into consideration before you actually land at that final scholarship. So yeah, without talking too much, let's get right into it. I'm going to be sharing my presentation as I did in the last session. And after the presentation ends, um, I would, open the floor to any questions you might have. And I'll also ask you a few questions about your schools and why you chose them. Okay, can you all see? Can you all see my screen? Exactly. Um, I can see your screen. Okay, right, so I'm going to start. Now, how to research graduate schools in the U.S. Um, graduate school applications in the U.S. can be very overwhelming. From GRE, writing, preparing the GRE to writing it, to preparing to write the TOEFL, to putting together your CV, your personal statements, putting together um, your recommendation let letters, chasing after lecturers to write that recommendation for you to looking out for let's say the the last employ, employer you work with to write a simple recommendation for you it can be a very daunting process and one of the processes that we do not have to neglect one of the steps in that process that we don't have to neglect is how to actually research a good graduate school in the united states so um, this is a very very important topic or a step in that process. So is there any formula to this? Is there like some kind of equation that we can solve to arrive at this? It's absolutely not, absolutely not. Okay, so let's move on. Now a little bit about me, I've already introduced myself, but I'm, uh, I have a bachelor's from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology where I study electrical engineering. Uh, after graduation, I worked as a research assistant in a research lab on campus uh, for one and a half years, almost two years. Now, during this period, I prepared for the GRE, uh, studied so many books, wrote the GRE, prepared so many applications to schools in the United States to study a master's. Unfortunately, I wasn't successful at these. I got admissions, but I did not get a full, full scholarship. So I decided to go to uh, Grenoble, where I studied a master's in control systems. Now, after the master's, I still had this desire to come to the United States to go to come to school. So I put in my application to a PhD program. Uh, but before I did this, I had multiple conversations with lecturers from different schools. I told them my skills. I gave them my skill set. I had several Skype calls. I can remember not less than five Skype calls where I had one-on-one -on -one interactions with lecturers and I was able to land that uh, scholarship to study in the United States. So I'm here to just share my experience. Now, um, 
the United States is a very huge country, a very, very huge country. It's made up of 50 states and the Washington DC. So this country is not just one place. It's not just New York. It's not just California. It's not just Florida. And it's not just Texas. It's made up of 50 individual states and you know, consistent of so many universities in that part, in each state. So just so that you know, there are actually, I looked this online yesterday and it's so impressive that there are 5,300 colleges in the United States alone. And certainly not all colleges offer graduate programs. So out of this, I think there are about 4,000 graduate programs being offered in the United States. Oh, why should you be paying attention to how to research graduate schools in the US? Um, it's really, really important because it actually increases your chances of landing that scholarship. So as I was um, as I was saying previously, that the school could be the reason why you are not landing that scholarship. You might have admission already, but you might not have a scholarship and you might be wondering, why don't I have the scholarship? What can I do differently? It could be the school, and we'll get to that. Um, you could be a top candidate in another university and not within the, the particular university that you are applying to. Now, um, it's so obvious that if, if you were a top candidate in that university, you would have had that scholarship. This is a very honest conversation. Um, there's nothing wrong with being honest with yourself. If you were a top candidate in that university, you would definitely have had that scholarship. However, because you are not a top candidate in that university, you do not have that scholarship. Does it mean that you can't have the scholarship in the school moving forward? No, that's not what it means. You might probably be a good candidate later when you enroll and you show, prove yourself to everybody that you are good and you get that 4.0 GPA and you're able to maintain that 4.0 for maybe a semester or two. But at the present time, taking into consideration all the material that you have presented to the school, the school doesn't feel like you are a top candidate to earn that scholarship. Most scholarships are merit-based. Merit means it's goes to the best candidates, those who actually merit it. How is merit-based scholarship uh, assessed? What are they looking at? From my point of view and from my um, experience, the GPA is very important. Your graduation, your graduating GPA, your GRE score is also very important. Your research work, is also very important. Your teaching experience is so important. Your CV is so important. Your personal statement is so important. Your recommendation letter. In fact, everything that they ask you to submit in the application process is so important to helping you get this. But one other thing that you have to consider is you might not be a top candidate in this particular university. So why not look at a different one? You actually could have a better chance of getting a job based on the school you applied to. There are some schools that are very close to um, that are very com uh, close to commercial centers, close to industrial areas or industrial cities, and where um, companies have their headquarters. There are some schools that are also prestigious in quotes, and this actually. Um, helps you land a job after graduation. So that's one thing you have, that's why you have to pay attention to the kind of school you select. So should you just select any school just because? Um, I, I don't think so. You simply have to really pay attention to, the, uh, to selecting the schools. So um, also selecting schools well or carefully helps you, you know, avoid wasting money. Um, as a, at the moment, I know that um, also selecting schools well or carefully helps you, you know, avoid wasting money. 
um, as a, at the moment, I know that from my experience, um, uh, doing a doing a graduate school application can range between forty dollars to a hundred dollars per school. So, if you apply to five schools, given that each of them maybe is costing you fifty dollars, that's a two hundred and fifty dollars. That's a lot of money. I don't know whether you have that money. So it also helps you, you know, avoid just wasting money and just going for the right school. Now, um, is there any method to do this? Absolutely not. So we are just going to have a discussion on, you know, an honest discussion. Do you feel like this school is a good fit for you or not? And if not, what is which other school would you be uh, a fit for? So where can we look for schools? Um, I think Google is a great place to start. You can look for schools on Google. Um, just type in um, colleges in the United States and it's going to bring you so many hits on that. YouTube is a great place to look for schools. Now, um, definitely you don't know how the school looks like. You can only go by what you see from the school's website. But to, in order to get an in-depth look into the campus, I feel the best place is YouTube. On YouTube, you will definitely um, get the opportunity to see the campus, the facilities they have, how huge the campus is, the, the, the kind of departments they have, um, the kind of faculty interactions they have, the class sizes and all that. Go on YouTube and, go, and YouTube the school, watch videos about the school, before you choose the school, don't do this after you choose the school. Before you choose the school, there's the Princeton Review, which gives you in-depth analysis of each school. There's popular US news. Um, US news is so popular with everybody looking to apply to the United States. They give you the, they, they actually do the ranking of the schools. They rank them from the top rank to the lowest ranked schools. Um, there's the Times Higher Education, there's topuniversity.com, and there's LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is actually, if not my, my favorite social media platform. And it's so weird saying this, but I go to LinkedIn so many times in a day than probably TikTok or Instagram. Um, and I'll tell you how I use LinkedIn, um, you know, on, on, on in my day to day. So uh, I'll talk about that moving forward. So what do, you, what do you look out for when you are actually searching for schools? Searching for schools is overwhelming. There is 5,300 colleges in the United States. When you go to US News on the website, there's a rank of the schools and you see a long list of schools. What should you actually be looking for? Should you just be looking out for the name of the school? Should you be looking for the rank? Should you be looking to find out, okay, which Ghanaian do I know? Or which of, I mean, which Ghanaian, since I guess many people from Ghana watch these videos, but if you are from any other country, it could be Nigeria, Kenya, wherever. Which Ghanaian do I know that goes to one of these schools? Okay, I know some guy from my undergrad who goes to this school. So for that reason, let me apply just because I know somebody who goes to that school. Is that why you are applying to that school? And if that's the reason, do you feel like that school is a fit for you or was a, it was a fit for that person? So what should you be looking out for before actually making the decision that I'm going to apply to the University of Houston. I'm going to apply to the University of Nebraska. I'm going to apply to the University of Arizona. Why should you, you know, what should you look out for? So I feel like one thing you should look out for is whether this university is in a big city or a small city. Why is this so important? Now, big cities are expensive to live in in the United States. Big cities are where you find these skyscrapers, um, tall buildings, these uh, tourist attractions, and 
everyone wants to, everyone who is the who and who, who is who wants to live in that city. Example is New York City. New York City is so expensive. Now imagine choosing NYU as a place to do your graduate school. It's a great school. It's actually top 50, I think, on US news, and it's a very, very good school. But it is a very expensive place to live in. So even if you your application goes through, you get that scholarship, you get that funding, and you get a stipend. Is the stipend enough to actually sustain your day to day and even to get some, um, you know, pocket money to save? Consider this before you actually choose a school. You've selected a school in, for example, uh, Texas. You, you choose to study in a big city like Houston. Take into consideration how the standard of living, the cost of living is in, uh, is in Houston and whether you will be able to afford to live in Houston. That is very, very important. You might be thinking, well, but that's not so important. All that matters is a scholarship. So after you get this scholarship, would you now be thinking about whether you, you get accommodation? That's like a second thought for now, but that should be the first thought. Um, also, big cities are where I think Americans, the citizens, actually like to live. And I could be wrong, you know. There's, of course, there's a broad spectrum of Americans everywhere, and everybody has different tastes. The Americans living everywhere, but you could see that there's a there's a re, there's a the, there's a real rush to actually go to schools in big cities, like in the state of California, for example. UCLA is a top school. Now, for my research, UCLA has gets the one of the highest applications to study in that school, University of California, Los Angeles. Why is this the case? Because LA, big city, everybody wants to live in LA. It's a very, very nice city. And if you really look at LA life, you will know what I'm talking about. It's like a big city, everybody wants to live there. Are you, as a student, graduate student, going to survive in that city financially? Do you feel like that city is your fit? And if that city is your fit, hey, go for it. Um, I'm also being careful here. Big cities, I'm not saying big cities are not a great place to study as a graduate student, but if it's not your style, you don't have to apply to that city. Look for, if you like the attraction, you like to you know travel to big cities to, stay, uh, to you know see the tourist attractions, why not live, look for university, which is about 20 minutes away from this big city or the outskirts of this big city so that you can, you know, travel, uh, go see nice buildings, architecture, what have you. So that's one thing you have to think about. Think about the weather. Uh, Google the weather in that city. Is it always cold? Do you like cold climates? Going back to New York, New York is very flashy and you hear so, so much buzz about New York, but New York is extremely cold in the winter. It's so cold and it snows so much. Colorado, and another example, uh, uh, it's, it, it snows so much there in the winter. Are you, is, is that your type of weather? Are you going to be comfortable in that type of weather? or you're coming from a tropical country like Ghana. Many countries in Africa are tropics, tropical countries, especially in West Africa. So you want to have a, uh, a state that actually feels similar to what you're used to. So uh, coming from Ghana, you would like to transition to a state where, you know, that it's not so cold in the winter uh, so that you'll be able to feel, you'll feel comfortable. Now, Am I saying there are not graduate students in this series? There are, but don't feel like you have you don't have a choice. You have a choice as to where you are going to live. That it doesn't always boil down to where am I going to get that scholarship. 
okay, it's there's a lot, and you might end up not liking the city, and that could affect your um, your graduate education. So you have to also look at uh, states that offer in-state tuition to the interna for international students. Um, I can speak of Texas because I live in Texas. Texas is a great state for in-state tuition. What is in-state tuition? In-state tuition is more or less a tuition waiver granted to international students who have not been resident in the state for more than 12 months. If you are an out-of-state student looking to study in a different state, you are subject to higher tuition costs because, simply because you are out of state. Students in state pay lower tuition costs as compared to students out of state. The difference could be huge. An out of state student could be paying close to $20,000 a year, and an in state, uh, 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 a student in state could be paying as little, not as little, but close to $8,000 a year. That's the difference. So, um, you have to look for states that are flexible with their in-state tuition policy. Um, it's not always the case where, of course, there are so many states around the United States that don't do this in-state tuition, even for uh, international students. But I know that Texas is a great place for in-state tuition. You can have in-state tuition even if you are not fully funded. Um, so that's one thing to note. Um, you can do your research. This is a beginning process for you. So go to Google, type in states that offer in-state tuition. This dramatically cuts down your tuition bill from, let's say, $20,000 to seven dollars or $8,000. And with, within that $8,000, if you are offered, two, let's say, $2,000 fellowship from the department or $1,000 STEM fellowship, if you are in STEM or business school, whatever fellowships they have, which will not cover your full tuition, it reduces your tuition bill and makes it more realistic to come to the United States without scholarship and then fight for scholarship. Prove yourself for a scholarship. Get that 4.0 GPA in the first semester and apply for a TA or an RA position and get your, your feet into the door. Okay, so we talk about, look at the size of the program of interest. Now, um, there are some schools that have been running programs for so many years, and there are some schools that just started. If your program just began in a school, like if you are an actual science student, and you apply to the University of um, uh, Arizona State University, and Arizona State University just started running the actual science program just last semester. Um, what do you think about this? That is it important to you? And should you be applying to the school just because, let's say, it's a school, it's on the list, let me apply simply because, you know, I can get in. I feel like a more established program gives you better resources to succeed because they have really good lecturers. Know that it's not only about going to school. You are going to school to get a good job or to be competitive to get that good job. It's not just the competition is not only to get a scholarship. After you get a scholarship, you have to face competition to get a job. How competitive are you in getting that job moving forward? So if it's a well-established program, I really like that idea. And I feel like that is a good program for you. If the program just started, chances are they are trying to recruit lecturers. They are doing a, a lot of experimental things and there might be some courses that are not going to be offered as a result of the program just you know just the initial stages of the program and it might be difficult for you so just take that into consideration these are some things um, look at the gre cutoff points the total cutoff point the gpa cutoff point honest conversation do you fall into this range do you feel like you can fall into this range if you have not written the gre um, you have your GRE coming up next month or in two weeks or in a week. Um, and then you are applying to a school that has a cutoff point of a, a score of uh, maybe 165 on the math and 160 on the, on the verbal. 
do you feel like you can make it? If you feel like you can make it, great, choose that school. If you feel like your strengths are not there, you've written a couple of tests, you've not had 160 or 165, why have you decided to send the score that you've gotten to that school? You know, so after writing the GRE score, uh, the GRE exam, you have to send scores to schools. Why are you sending a score that is not up to the cutoff point of the school to the school just because um, you just want to send scores to schools? It's I don't think that shows good planning. So just uh, you know, take your time. It's no rush. Going to school is a is a plan. Plan your steps. Um, look at the score requirements, write them down and plan towards it, work towards it. If your dream school is UCLA, work towards it. Write the GRE several times if that's what you want. So um, you can also look at the resources in the school. I've spoken about that already. The resources like labs, libraries, grants, teaching assistantships and summer fellowships. Um, Pay attention to the labs in the school. If you're an engineering student, a computer science student, look for schools that have that have so many groups. Um, there could be a group in charge of, let's say, um, control systems, another group in charge of machine learning, another group in charge of uh, uh, electronics and micro, um, you know, power systems. Just look for 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 departments or School, departments in schools that have multiple um, groups that you can actually get to work with on thesis on your research projects or to become research assistants for these groups. Um, look at how the faculty and the graduate school are actually responsive to emails. Um, you know, test them, send them an email. If you have an admission from Missouri University of Science and Technology, you have an admission. Have you ever contacted graduate school to just ask them about um, scholarship opportunities that you could apply to? How quickly did they respond? Did they even ever respond to you? That should show you whether you, know, you want to be in the school or not and whether this school is actually worth it for you to go through all that hassle to be in the school. Uh, as I already spoke about career success, so that the school really puts you ahead when it comes to completion. When you finish, does it put you ahead to get the job? And the school's reputation is so important. Okay, so when should you start applying or looking out for schools? there is it's not a rush to come to go to graduate school if your plan is to go to graduate school you have to start the process at least this is the least that you can you can have a year before the due date 12 months before the due date you have to start looking for schools you have to contact the schools the graduate schools the faculty reach out to them, contact them and see how responsive they are. Um, talk to alumni of these schools through LinkedIn. Um, send them a message. And this is how I use LinkedIn. You can send a message to every, anybody on LinkedIn as long as, I guess, you have a contact in common or a two or three contacts in common. And, it, and provided their profile is not private. So you realize from looking at someone's profile on LinkedIn that he had a scholarship. He did a master's in the school. He had a scholarship. Reach out to them and ask them how they, they, they got it. How did you get the scholarship? What did you do? How was your process? Before you send in an application to the school, this is the first thing you should be doing not when you get the admission and that's when you are scrambling for scholarship don't wait till you get the admission and then you are trying to scramble for scholarship 
you actually have to do a calculated risk or uh, well do a self assessment most likely than not you will know by the before you apply whether you are going to get the scholarship or not or you know before you apply whether you are going to get admitted or not sometimes of course it becomes it's a surprise and then it comes and you don't have even a, you don't have admission or you don't have the um, scholarship but yes start a year before the due date reach out to alumni of schools um, from your country it could be from a different country just reach out it's it's not for sale it's free send them a message on linkedin if they reply fine if they if they don't reply move on it, it, it doesn't um, take anything to do that and it doesn't take anything away from you because in the in in the end you are looking for that scholarship and you have to do everything it takes to get that scholarship whether it takes um, sending unsolicited messages to people just do that and there are people out there who actually send you a reply um, so also you know you have to spend at least eight to nine months i feel preparing to write the gre and the two of test um, you can you know write and rewrite several times within this eight to nine month period there's no rush. If you feel like your test scores are not good enough, go back, study again, and write it again. Just so that you meet the score, the cutoff grade of the school that you are looking for. So that you don't even meet it by you, you know, you surpass it. Um, plan your personal statements four to five months before the due date. Do personal statements work? Yes, they do. Um, does graduate school look at them? Yes, they do look at your personal statements. In fact, your personal statements are usually forwarded and sent to all the faculty members in the department together with your application packet. So your application packet uh, will include your CV, your recommendation letters, your personal statements, your maybe you can upload um the research work that you've done all of these is actually circulated amongst all the uh, professors in the department asking if they want to um, take a student for a research position or if they want to take a student for to be a teaching assistant so if your personal statement is really compelling i feel like it just puts you ahead of the the crowd you just want to stand out, you see. So put more effort into your personal statement. And, um, you know, take your time and fill in the application online before they do it. How many schools should you apply to? Should you apply to so many? I would say between four and six is fine. Um, you don't have to do too much, like um, applying to 10 schools. If you will get rejected, you will get rejected amongst all these 10 schools. Your chances don't really increase based on the number of schools you apply to. And I feel like I'll later on talk about this. I mean, the second, the next step. You know, um, have a mix of top rank, middle rank, and low rank schools. Low rank in quotes. So rankings are not an indication of academic prestige of a university. A lot goes into consideration. Um, if you read or if you go to US News, you will see actually what they take into consideration to rank university. It is not academic resources only. It takes a lot. So if you see a school which is ranked 200 out of, uh, uh, yeah, okay, 200 on US News, and you feel like, uh, oh, this school is just too low, um, 200. What am I going to do in the school? Rank 200. I'm sorry, but you don't know the, the full picture. If you were to, you know, go to this school and visit there personally, you won't be saying what you are saying. The, the schools are virtually neck to neck when it comes to prestige, academic prestige. They are virtually neck to neck. The difference is not much when it comes to um, academics. The top-ranked schools might have more endowment 
they might have more money and able to give more scholarships as a result of having that much endowment. But it still doesn't make them a better school academically. They might have great lecturers, don't get me wrong. They might have really good lecturers, but the low rank in code schools have good lecturers as well. Lecturers who went to top schools as well. So don't just you know, get this twisted. The schools are virtually the same. They are virtually the same. And it's just you know, a status thing. Uh, going to Harvard is definitely status. Uh, if you go to if you go to Harvard, hey, we give you the respect that you deserve. If you go to uh, UCLA, Columbia, if you go to uh, University of Columbia, sorry, uh, if you go to UCLA, if you go to the top ranked schools like UT Austin, we give you all that respect for sure. But it still doesn't mean you will not get a great education in a low ranked school. Don't be clouded by ranking. Rankings are just a guide. So, so uh, dues. I'll say that what you don't have to do is to apply to too many schools. Just so many that you are, you know, spending excessive money. If you get a scholarship, I applied to one school and I got one scholarship. Because before I sent in an application, I knew that I was getting the funding. Because I had spoken to the lecturers, I had I had had one on one with them, and they had assessed me, and they had given me the go ahead to apply. So before you put in your application, you would know whether you have this funding or not. For TA ships, for teaching assistantships, your the teaching assistantship uh, positions are assessed at during your application. So what I mean is, let me be clear. When, you're when you send in your application, your application is assessed to become a teaching assistant. Your application is assessed at the point of applying, right? Whether you are a good candidate for TA ship or not, based on your GPA, your GRE scores, or so on and so forth. So don't be fixated on ranking. Uh, don't be fixated, fixated, fixated on well-known states or well-known cities. Um, don't write the GI too many times. I've said this um, previously. Uh, you know, the effort that you put into writing the GRE so many times, that effort could be spent in improving your research profile. That is a, that's a sure way because it boils down to, you know, the faculty have, um, let me pick this in because maybe my thoughts are running a bit wild right now. But I'll say the faculty have research funds from research organizations like the NSF, like the Department of Energy, like the NIH, uh, so many organizations. Um, the US government to do research. And out of these funds, they allocate some money to fund research assistance, assistance to help them do research. So the bulk of the emphasis is on research for a university. We, universities are established for research. The teaching is for sure important because undergraduates and graduate students are taught, but the, the reputation of the university actually improves based on the research. So if you are a good researcher or you have a good research profile, chances are you will get so many offers because they need you in the university to help them get that level. If you are good with Python, if you know your machine learning, if you know coding, your, your coding uh, uh, level is great. If you already have a published paper, even a report, if your undergraduate thesis was top notch and is publishable, chances are the lecturer wants you on his team because he feels you can be an, a good addition to that, um, you know, that team. And the lecturers know, they've dealt with 
they've seen applicants with top GRE score come in and fail. They know. They know that a GRE score of 165 is not an indication of a great candidate. They know this. And for sure, if you come to the system, you will know this, that there are some students who come in with like exceptional GRE scores, but is this an indication of a, you know, a good graduate student, a good researcher? Probably not. And you know what happens is, of course, if the, if the student is uh, not good enough, they will end up losing their scholarship after a semester or two. And if that happens, that shows, that gives the indication that a GRE score is not an indication of you know, a top candidate. So one, writing a GRE once or twice is good enough. Third time is definitely good enough um, to improve your score, to get the cutoff, but trying to outdo yourself to get a 165, 168, 170. By all means, do that if you can, but just trying and trying and failing is not going to improve your chances of getting a scholarship or not. If you did not get a scholarship with a score of 168, you won't get a scholarship with 170. It's, there's, a re there's a different reason aside from your GRE score. Uh, start applications before you write a GRE. So um, if you are now, you are about to write a GRE and you don't even have, an, you don't have a list of schools that you want to apply to. That means, of course, you did not, you know, you put the cart before the horse and you did not uh, plan properly. No problems with that. Just moving forward try and get the list of schools and you know do things right moving forward and um, get in touch with the advisors even before you write a GRE even before you you know tell them I'm going to write a GRE next week um, if they ask you what is what's the following week they can ask you what is your score on the GRE you tell them and they can actually say okay you know what no problem I'll still admit you or okay your GRE wasn't good enough can you go and rewrite then you go anywhere. That those interactions are actually very common. Okay, so um, at this point, I wanted to do a practical exercise um, for us all. So I'll show you uh, a sample recommendation for this practical exercise. Uh, I'm putting myself out there because, of course, I'm the uh, the uh, resource person here, and I feel like recommendation letters are so underrated, uh, so underrated by everybody, but they really matter. They really matter, and we usually leave the recommendation letters to our lecturers to complete, and we don't even see what they wrote. So, what constitutes a good recommendation letter? Last week, I. Last time I suggested that before you finish your undergrad, try and leave with recommendation letters from lecturers that you feel, you know, can help you out to get into graduate school or in the courses that you have interest to pursue. Leave with written recommendation letters, soft copy or hard copy, whatever it may be. Even if you are not ready to go to graduate school, at that time, in the future, maybe two, three years to come, if you are ready to go to graduate school, and the, of course the recommendation letters will be outdated, you go back to the lecturer, request a new recommendation letter based on what he wrote a few years ago. The reason is by the time you are leaving school, you are they actually know you, they know your face, they've taught you in their class, they can write a a better recommendation letter than writing a vague one that really is like recycled for every candidate that comes into the office and they just slot in your name and your, your GPA and that's it. It has to be more personal. So for it to be personal, it has to be taken at the most recent time. And unfortunately, maybe you might not be ready for graduate school, but still take it so that by the time you are ready, there is an actual evidence of him writing a good recommendation for you that can be used in the future. So uh, this is my recommendation letter. 
I'm sharing this with you. So this is a recommendation letter that I had for a program that I applied to in the United States. So typical recommendation letter on a on a letterhead from the lab that I work in. Um, or this is from a, a, a teacher in my school. So this is from the lab that the lecturer works with. Okay, if he doesn't, he or she doesn't work with a lab. A, a recommendation letter on uh, a, le a school letterhead works, right? So um, the date for sure has to be there, and it has to be general because this is a recommendation letter that I required for several purposes, like job search, like PhD. I didn't know what I was going to do after I graduated, so he has to, he or she has to make it a blank. Uh, you know, introduction to whom it may concern, right? So um, I'll read it out so that it's easier for our viewers on YouTube to follow. So it says, I'm writing this letter in support of me, Edward Quam. I am a researcher in the NECS team in Inria Gypsa Lab in Grenoble, France. I teach a class on distributed algorithms and network systems in the master's program in Grenoble, which Edward has attended. His class is an introduction to graph theory, proper, and especially properties of adjacency and Laplacian matrices, Markov chains and distributed algorithms, with a focus of, on linear consensus and a little glance at more advanced topics. We also had some lab sessions where students implemented algorithms on real sensors writing some C code and exploiting the FIT IoT lab infrastructure. I'll be jumping unnecessary uh, sentences, but Edward has been a very serious student, right? I guess I was serious. Attending all classes and labs and working hard, staying extra hours for the lab. He has obtained a good grade on a written exam. My grade is there and my rank is there out of the number of students in the class. And my grade on the lab is there. And my, so my grade on the final exam, and my grade on the lab, which was carefully written and included the required comments and theoretical explanations. Not a quick collection of plots as many students do. Edward has told me that this introductory class has raised his interest in network systems and that he would like to pursue a PhD in a related topic. I do not have any open positions at this moment, but I recommend him for such a position elsewhere. This is my recommendation letter that I submitted to my PhD program. So you are competing with people with recommendation letters like this, written from professors who have the time to write detailed stuff about their students, about how their students performed, what, was, what the class was about, the score of the student, the rank of the student. You might have been the, the first rank in your class, in your, in your undergraduate class on statistics, but nobody knows because it's not on your recommendation letter. Nobody knows this fact. And it's, it's not showing the admissions, the full picture about how great a candidate you are. So this is missing. And recommendation letters are a way to you know, showcase this. Without this recommendation letter, maybe I wouldn't have had this PhD or I wouldn't have had this scholarship. But looking back at the kind of recommendation letters that I submitted for my master's, it just makes sense that, hey, I didn't get them because Many of these the recommendation letters I submitted were vague recommendations, not saying much about the candidate and just saying that I recommend him for a PhD or a master's. Why are you recommending him? So push the lecturers, push the people who are writing the recommendation for you to write better recommendations and request to actually see the recommendations that are written. One way is fine, as I said, get a recommendation letter 
when you exit school so that you have a reference to um, show your lecturer in the future if this recommendation, let's say it's an email that's going to be sent to his, e uh, his mail. He knows exactly what to put in the email because there is, um, you know, a documentation of such. Um, so, right, we're gonna move on. This is another uh, recommendation. It's not clear on this page because it was scanned and all that. But the same thing, the, the name of the lab is there. In this case, CNRS and so many titles. Great. That, it's just impressive, but I, I don't know any of that. You know, great letterhead. The lecturer, his position, the link to the lecturer's website and his papers to just show the reputation the lecturer has. Okay. Then he continues, talks about me, what the, the class, okay, so he talks about me, he talks about my interests. I'm, I'm going to read a few lines of this. So it says, Edward Kwam, me, has shown interest for this course focusing on modeling, stability, and stabilization of hybrid systems. Um, it talks about the activities that we performed in the lab, and it talks about my grades at the end of the exam. And it talks about my rank. And it's a, he says, I believe Edward is a serious student with good technical skills, which will allow him to pursue PhD studies in the field of systems and controls. So, um, you know, it's just, a, I think it's a good um, recommendation letter. This is not about me. I think it just goes to show you that the recommendation that you submitted to your application probably wasn't telling the full story. You were a first class student. You were probably top in so many courses that you did in the university. You, you ranked maybe top five out of a class of, I know in my class we were like over oh, 60. Like out of a class of 60, you were top five. That's impressive. Why is that not in the recommendation letter? Why is that not on the, your CV? Um, fine, you can put it on your CV, but it just it's it holds more weight coming from the lecturer who taught the subject. Why I, why is that not included? And I see that there are so many brilliant first class students, but it's just the recommendation letter just truncates the opportunity. It it kills them even before it kills their dream, even before they can actually get that scholarship. It's just not, it's, it's, it's not right. And I feel like you have to push the lecturers who are writing these recommendation letters to actually do better than blanket recommendation letters. And uh, I've been there before, they don't probably have time, but, you know, just chase after them and uh, yeah, follow up. Another practical example I wanted us to do is to look at US news and the rankings. So um, at this point,